uh, Mr. Krishnamurti to comment on what has been said, uh, said so far and also make his own uh, suggestions about what can be done in the near future. Sabko namaskar, but my Hindi can be good only for baat karne ke liye, bhaashan karne ke liye nahi hai. So you have to excuse me, I'll speak in English. Small minds and great empires go ill together, said Herman Feiner long, long ago. I think in spite of more than 70 years of our, or about 70 years of our freedom, we still have small minds in our governance. But what is important is not, I mean, this forum is not meant for governance reforms. This forum is meant for electoral reforms. I do agree the consequence of electoral reforms will be good governance. But then whether electoral reforms are possible or desirable, these are, of course, issues to be discussed and decided. I thought, having regard to the theme of the conference, I'll refer to six or seven focused areas where we must turn our attention if you really want to bring about uh, some kind of an improvement in our political system. The first change I would advocate and uh, which need to be very seriously addressed relates to a separate law for political parties. Unfortunately, in our country, as Mr. Gopal Swami mentioned, there was no reference to the political party in the constitution and then later on it came to the anti-defection law. I think we need to regulate our political parties better than what we have done so far. There are many areas which can be covered in, the, in such an act. I think the Association for Democratic Reforms brought out a model uh, legislation for this purpose have gone through. Well, it can be improved upon, but certain changes are necessary to ensure that our political parties function better than what they are. Some of the important areas relate to in that, the internal democracy in the party, financial discipline, and the ceiling on expenditure, which goes in the name of, you know, uh, controlling the expenditure of the candidates and the parties. These are important aspects which need to be mentioned, including what uh, Mr. Jay Prakash Narayan mentioned about the freebies. Although uh, Supreme Court addressed this issue, unfortunately they didn't give a specific ruling except to say that the Election Commission may, uh, may form the guidelines for this purpose. I see no reason why, in fact I did um, brief the advocate who appeared in this case. I said they can make a simple solution saying that manifestos cannot contain anything other than public goods. It cannot be a private good. A section of the people should not get a benefit. If it is for the general public, the public good, then it can come in the manifesto. But then, unfortunately, it has not been so clearly spelt out and it's very vague now, the guidelines, and still the freebies game goes on. This uh, separate law for political parties will have to address many issues and apart from the, uh, you know, the financial discipline, the internal um, elections and uh, a matter relating to uh, rotation of officers, etc. Unfortunately, it doesn't address the dynasty system. That also should be coming, should be addressed. I personally feel that public officers should not be held, I mean, the, the party post should not be held by the same family members continuously. It must be ensured that if there is one family member, another family member cannot be in the same public, cannot hold a party post. So there are a number of issues which can be included in this and it is necessary to bring about a fairly comprehensive, comprehensive and scientific law in this regard. The second point I would like to mention is about the first past post system about which Mr. Jay Prakash Narayan mentioned. I think it has lived its utility. We need to change. What will be the alternative? Of course, there are a number of alternatives available. 
One of the things that um, I was quite impressed was the one that was there in Palestine. It is not a full-fledged government, it is not a sovereign state, but still they have, I'm not saying that it should be repeated here or we should follow the German experience and so on. I personally feel maybe it would be good for the, con for the parliament if certain percentage of seats are voted directly at a national level. That means it will not be constituency wise. For example, in, in Palestine, for example, there are about 126 seats, if I'm not mistaken. 63 are elected by the constituencies method, and the remaining 63 are elected on a national basis. All citizens vote. They, have, they are given a preference in the list. I know in, in a country like India, it's not easy to implement it. At least certain percentage, maybe 10% or 20% of parliament, because it will bring about some kind of a national outlook and um, this uh, national outlook can come only if you have national leaders in the parliament. We have seen how parliament functioned in early 50s and 60s and how they are functioning now. Members of the parliament talk about not, not merely about the constituency, they talk about the specific problem in that district or in that town. That's not the way parliament is expected to function. So the first past post system should go. An alternative has to be found. The first past post system also has, has resulted in proliferation of political parties. Because in a, in a constituency, if there is a, a particular community which is dominant, each party puts up a leader of that particular community. With the result, the person who is voted to power he comes to power with only 20 to 23 percent of the votes and he claims himself to be representative of the people of that constituency. But I am reminded of what um, Edmund Burke said to the voters of uh, one of the constituencies. He said, please elect such leaders who are representing your constituency's interests, but when there is a conflict between national interest and the constituency interest, please vote for the one who will vote for the national interest. So unfortunately, at the recruitment stage itself, as many of the speakers mentioned, we have candidates who don't deserve to represent the people. And they come into position because they think that they can harness the votes of a majority of the community to which the constituency is dominant. So second is the first past system should go. The third suggestion I have is about decentralization of powers. Mr. Um, Jay Prakash Narayan also mentioned it. I think people have to come to Delhi for even small things to be, to be approved. They have to come to the state government for certain things to be approved. And um, the famous amendment to the Panchayat Raj, etc. I think it has been brief, it has been verbose, but no specific purpose has been achieved. There is more corruption in Delhi, more corruption in the state capitals only because powers are concentrated there. So we must find method that the powers are distributed. It is not that it will do away with corruption at the municipal level or the, or the panchayat level, but at least the scale will come down. And I think people will know not how to vote and how, why they should not vote for a person. But at the moment, such ignorance, I mean, such knowledge of the vote Candidate is not there. And we vote for a person who turns out to be uh, terribly uh, incompetent. The recall of politicians, recall of the representatives, okay, or no, here again it's a controversial suggestion. I know that there are difficulties in a country like this to implement that. But if you can have a power of recall, at least some misdemeanor people will be afraid of. Of course, I have a suggestion that first two and a half years there cannot be a recall of representatives. The half the term of the House should have gone. Thereafter, there should be a, a possibility of a recall, a threat of a recall. Not that um, you are, you'll be able to recall a person with uh, all those conditions attached. But a threat of a recall of misdemeanor by a politician may improve. I mean, it's only a pious wish, may improve the quality of our representatives and their performance in the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament. The next area relates to the state elections, That's, I mean by the, the local body elections. Unfortunately, the constitution <coughs> has delegated this power of appointing a 
state election commission to the state government and this law relating to the state election commission varies from state to state and it I don't know whether I can send, um, simplify and say that it is a den of corruption but I must say that the appointments are questionable in most of the state election commissions and they are all appointed with a particular purpose and in a state like Tamil Nadu the state election commission is appointed only for three years you can be reappointed. You can imagine what kind of an independence that the election, state election commissioner will enjoy. So, this is another area where we need to address if you really want to attack corruption. Because most of the corruption now is based in the states and at the center. And if you have to uh, really eradicate corruption, these are areas which need to be specifically addressed. Uh, then the fast track holds for the politicians. I think it must be made mandatory that if a politician is involved in corruption matters or serious crime matters, the fast track court should be an automatic thing and it, there should be a time limit within which it should be finalized, <coughs> preferably only. Yeah. There are many countries where such uh, facilities or provisions are there where fast track courts can decide quickly so that there will be some respect for law because in most of the Indian politicians, they survive and thrive because they know even if a conviction is going to come, it's going to become final probably after 10 to 15 years, is beach me cow where nobody knows. So uh, the uncertainty of uh, legal verdict, I think, enables them to go ahead and do whatever they want to do. The next point I would like to refer to is um, uh, the recent changes relating to funding of the political parties. It's very sad that some of the provisions that have been brought recently on the ground of improving the, uh, the, um, the funding of the political parties is absolutely counterproductive. It is going to promote more anonymity in donations. It's going to promote more lack of transparency in financial um, dealings with the political parties. The bonds, I mean, and also the donation being reduced to 2,000 rupees in cash. As somebody was mentioning today, Mr. I think Jay Prakashnan, what is the difficulty if even if it is one rupee, a donation cannot be given by a check? And in any case, 2,000 rupees, they're bringing down 20,000 to 2,000 is a mockery of the system. And uh, in, for example, in Canada, if, there's a limit even to a family giving a donation to political parties. And now you say that you'll issue bearer bonds, which can be transferred, you will not know who the donor is. What is the purpose? Is it that you want to improve the strength of the political parties and financial strength of these political parties, such immoral methods? I strongly condemn these changes that have come. The simultaneous elections or multi-phased elections, I thought before we go to simultaneous elections, we must have a single-phase election in each state. Today, for example, in UP, it took in seven phases the elections. When we were, I was there, it was three phases election in UP. I'm not saying that um, it is not desirable, considering the law and order conditions, the election commission and system has thought, but that is again promoting Corruption, it is promoting hate, hateness, or uh, hate speeches rather. It aggravates as the face progresses on. So if we can find a method by which a single phase election in each state can be brought about before the simultaneous election, that would be a great change in the quality of our electoral system in also ensuring, you know, for example, if, if you are having a seven phases, in this, when you are barred from speaking in the seventh constituency, seventh phase constituency, you can speak from the sixth phase constituency and still address the people, with the media being what it is. I, it's farce to have this kind of, you know, uh, restrictions. The model code of conduct cannot apply only to that particular phase. It can apply in other places. In some places, not, not always. I'm talking about, for example, in one state the election takes place, in another state, still you can have canvassing going on. So some solutions should be found out. I personally feel that the 
single phase election is in each state is more important than the simultaneous election, which is of course desirable, but it may be more difficult to implement. I think I have covered um, most of the points. Uh, Yeah, the last thing I would like to mention about the criminal entering the policy, that is also can be covered through the separate law. We have been agitating about this and um, because of the judicial delays, uh, the criminals are easily um, nominated, they get elected and the lack of foreign, the fast track courts also uh, aggravates the issue. So in my personal view, these are some of the urgent electoral reforms which need to be addressed. If you really want to fight corruption, if you really want to promote a healthy system of having good candidacy elections, the youngsters in India are certainly more committed to electoral reforms than probably the earlier generation. I find a lot of activity, for example, we had a, a great movement in Chennai some time back. And if youngsters can unite and bring about the need for some of the urgent electoral reforms, I'm not saying that these are ex exhaustive, but at least about seven to ten maximum areas where reforms can be brought about, there is some hope for democracy in this country. Thank you very much.